Today, we give thanks to God for a great deliverance. Speaking from our empire's oldest capital city, we were all battered, I would never for one moment daunted or dismayed. Speaking from London, I ask you to join with me in that act of thanksgiving. And Germany, and the enemy who drove all Europe into war, has been finally overcome. But at this hour, when the dreadful shadow of war has passed far from our hearths and homes in these islands, we may at last make one pause for thanksgiving and then turn our thoughts to the tasks all over the world which peace in Europe brings with it. First, and let us remember those who will not come back, their constancy and courage in battle, their sacrifice and endurance in the face of a merciless enemy. Let us remember the men in all the services, and the women in all of the services who have laid down their lives. We have come to the end of our tribulation, and they are not with us at the moment of our rejoicing. Forced to step up and meet his royal responsibilities unexpectedly, George VI saw the nation through some difficult times and witnessed the changing landscape of Britain. Born on December 14, 1895, he succeeded to the throne after the shock abdication of his brother, Edward VIII, who chose lover Wallace Simpson over his hereditary right to be king. George was subsequently crowned at Westminster Abbey in May 1937. A reluctant king who was crowned on the day that his brother was supposed to have become king. When war broke out on the 3rd of September, 1939, King George VI was three years into his reign. He became king unexpectedly following the abdication of his brother, King Edward VIII in 1936. Having never expected to take on this huge role, his early life and career did not bode well as he was plagued by a stammer, which severely impacted the task of public speaking. George VI was the opposite of his brother Edward growing up. He was Albert, he was known as Bertie. He was shy, he was retiring while his brother was outgoing and, and gregarious. He had no particular interest in fashion, no particular interest in chasing after women, although his brother encouraged him in doing so and he was in fact involved in various affairs and so on which have been not as much talked about as you would expect. But as a character, he was a much less likely king than Edward ever was because he was somebody who didn't seem to be very comfortable around people. As a teenager, he had served in the Royal Navy and actively participated in the First World War, joining HMS Collingwood and taking part in the Battle of Jutland, earning him a mention in dispatches. After his time in the Navy, he would join the Royal Air Force and become a qualified pilot in 1919. George, unlike Edward, was actually allowed to serve in World War I, and he did so with some distinction. And he was seen as somebody who was able to 
both be quite brave under fire, but also somebody who would actually do the job. And I think that what was important for him, as it was important for his brother, was mixing with the people who would later become his subjects, because it gave him a real insight into what it's actually like to be a young man in, in 1914, 1915 Britain. And he saw appalling things up close. I mean, he saw death, he saw horrendous maimings and so on. And that's the kind of thing that really affected him. And I think that was psychologically hugely important for him, that he'd actually had a real sense of what war was like. So when the Second World War came about, he was much better equipped to be a wartime king than his brother would have been. At the end of the First World War, as Duke of York, he began to carry out public duties, concentrating his efforts mainly on industrial matters, visiting factories and becoming president of the Industrial Welfare Society. Meanwhile, in his private life, in 1923, he married Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, the daughter of the Earl of Strathmore. Bertie found his closest confidant and greatest supporter in his, in his wife, Elizabeth Bowes Lyon. After a number of unsuccessful attempts to woo her and, and propose marriage to her, she eventually consented. Uh, and agreed to, to agree to marry him. They would become the Duke and Duchess of York, and really they embodied everything that was best about the monarchy in this period, in that they, they, they presented themselves as very dutiful figures. They went out into public life, uh, they toured towns and cities, they opened hospitals. They did all that was expected of royals of their generation. The marriage would prove most successful, and the couple had two daughters, Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret. Elizabeth supported her husband in all his monarchical duties, as well as providing moral support in his efforts to overcome his stammer. The family unit proved united and strong, giving stability in the eyes of the general public, with George referring to the family as we four. While he gladly would have settled for a life of domestic bliss away from the spotlight, unfortunately, as a result of his brother's actions, it was not meant to be. Instead, after his brother shunned his royal duty in favor of a life with his American wife, George was forced to rise to the occasion, despite his misgivings about fulfilling such a role. George VI was desperate not to become king. He was absolutely terrified by responsibilities of what would happen. But when he became king, he accepted it. He accepted that it was his responsibility and that it was something that he would have to deal with. And although there are people who sneered at him, such as the diarist Chips Channon, for lacking glamour, for not being a charismatic figure, for his stutter, he was somebody who was trying his very best. And I think that's what you conceive a king as being, somebody who was trying to be like his father, not like his brother. The king and his family would play a crucial role in the coming years as figureheads of a nation and with a public image to maintain morale-boosting exercises in unity were key. The royal family at this time managed to integrate themselves with the general public, who were soon suffering the full effects of war with bombing and rationing. In late August 1939, German dictator Adolf Hitler and Soviet leader Joseph Stalin signed the German-Soviet non-aggression pact which incited a frenzy of worry in London and Paris. Hitler had long planned an invasion of Poland, a nation which Great Britain and France had guaranteed military support if it were attacked. The pact with Stalin meant that Hitler would not face a war on two fronts, having Soviet assistance in his conquering and dividing of the Polish nation. The mood in Britain was foreboding war was emerging. It was inevitable, unavoidable, undeniable, and everyone knew it. By the summer of 1939, the Civil Defense Service had enrolled over one million recruits. Mr. Churchill claims that public opinion is growing in favor of compulsory national service, and in his view, it's increasingly probable that we shall have it before long. And he ends with stirring words. Those that volunteer today are the devoted vanguard of the British nation, 
arming in the defense of the freedom and the progress of mankind. On the Horse Guards Parade, Sir John Anderson and Mr. Herbert Morrison unite in sending off a new drive for ARP recruits. Two of the GPO's mobile post office vans have been converted into traveling recruiting offices. So obviously it's less important that you should write a love letter to your girlfriend and that you should join up to protect her and all the other girlfriends from the dangers that threaten Britain in a warlike world. Excuse me, speaking personally, what do you think about conscription? Well, personally, I think it's a very good thing for this country at the present state of world affairs. It's a wise move on the government's part, but I'm very doubtful of it. Conscription is a drastic measure, but conditions in Europe today call for drastic measures. Well, I think it's a fine thing. I've done my bit, and I think my sons will be only too willing to do their bit. Well, I don't mind joining up. I could do a new Sunday suit and a pair of daisy roots out of it. On September 1st, Hitler invaded Poland from the west. Two days later, France and Britain declared war on Germany, beginning World War II. I am speaking to you in the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. This is going to be a stern and a bitter war and we can't afford to lose it. We only need to think of the cruel and tragic fate of other countries to realize what would become of us if we did. Nor can we afford to make a draw of it and be compelled to fight another in a few years' time. Civilization couldn't survive either a German victory or a third world war. Let's make sure this time of bringing a lasting settlement and permanent peace back to the world. Halt! Who goes there? And to the challenge comes the answer, the king. His majesty then produces his identity card for inspection by the vigilant home guardsman. This is the human story of the king's arrival at Woodford, Essex, when he inspects 2,000 men of the local defense volunteers. Over 80% of these volunteers are ex-servicemen and therefore well able to give a good account of themselves. This enthusiastic citizen army comes under the command of Lieutenant General Sir Alan Brook, the new CNC of the home forces. Perhaps one of the most important responsibilities of the Commander-in-Chief will be that of coastal defence, pictures of which we now show you for the first time. From concrete and steel emplacements, the guns of Britain point a warning to the European gangsters. These pictures give only a small idea of how the coastal defence force will deal with an invader. We leave it to the guns to tell their story in more eloquent language than words. in the words of Lord Halifax, we shall continue to stand four square against the forces of evil. On September 17th, Soviet troops invaded Poland from the east, and being under attack from both sides, Poland quickly fell. By early 1940, Germany and the Soviet Union had divided control over the nation. During the six months following the invasion of Poland, the lack of action on the part of Germany and the Allies in the West led to talk in the news media of a phony war. The growing certainty that German bombers would make their way to the British skies meant that a mass evacuation of children to the sanctuary of the countryside was no longer just a possibility. The exodus had begun. Mothers waved goodbye to their children, many of whom had never been away from home before. 
let alone under such circumstances. Thousands of you in this country have had to leave your homes and be separated from your fathers and mothers. My sister Margaret Rose and I feel so much for you, as we know from experience what it means to be away from those we love most of all. To you living in new surroundings, we send a message of true sympathy. And at the same time, we would like to thank the kind people who have welcomed you to their homes in the country. All of us children who are still at home think continually of our friends and relations who have gone overseas, who have traveled thousands of miles to find a wartime home and a kindly welcome in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and the United States of America. My sister and I feel we know quite a lot about these countries. Our father and mother have so often talked to us of their visits to different parts of the world. So it is not difficult for us to picture the sort of life you are all leading and to think of all the new sights you must be seeing and the adventures you must be having. I want, on behalf of all the children at home, to send you our love and best wishes to you and to your kind hosts as well. My sister is by my side, and we are both going to say good night to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. King George VI paid state visits to France in 1938 and to Canada and the United States in 1939 the first British monarch to enter the United States. There are two speeches made at the beginning of 1939, one by Neville Chamberlain and one by George VI. Neville Chamberlain's is remembered because it was the one in which he essentially said, we have failed to find an, an agreement in our state of war, it's the one that everybody knows. George VI made a speech later that day, and it's very interesting to see that this speech which he made, and it was a, it was a speech broadcast on the radio, was one that he was able to do thanks to the help of Logue, where there wasn't a lot of stammering. If, if you listen to it now, he's speaking clearly, he's got a strong voice, he's able to sound... He's not charismatic the way his brother was. You can, sit, you can, you can hear, but he doesn't have the public speaking ability. But he was able to do it. He was able to actually say to his people, we are, we are about to fight this war with the aid of God and we will prevail. For the second time in the lives of most of us, we are at war. Over and over again, we have tried to find a peaceful way out of the differences between ourselves and those who are now our enemies. At the start of the war, there was a real concern at the palace that the British monarchy didn't really have a role to play in this war, that it could offer leadership by, by visiting troops, for example, uh, but that it didn't really have a stage to perform on, as had been the case during the First World War. The King and Queen remained at Buckingham Palace throughout the war. They sent their daughters, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret, to Windsor Castle for safety. Elizabeth and Margaret largely lived at Windsor Castle because it was thought to be safer than a Buckingham Palace. And obviously they were kept out of harm's way. But Elizabeth was actually a member of the ATS. And it was very interesting both for her on a personal level, but also from a propaganda level, that the King's heir was somebody who was actually doing things. She was being seen as having practical tasks and so on. And it was, very, I think, very important for the royal family that they were all seen as doing something, doing their bit. <laughs> Taking a driving course at a training center is Princess Elizabeth, second subaltern ATS. She has been learning to drive and maintain all types of motor vehicles. When the training center was visited by the King and Queen and Princess Margaret, they found Princess Elizabeth in overalls working on the engine of a Red Cross lorry. A 
after watching other girls at work, the king returned and jokingly asked the princess, haven't you got it mended yet? The Princess Elizabeth, honorary second subaltern, ATS, is now a competent mechanic and proud of the fact. King George VI and Queen Elizabeth toured many of the areas that had suffered from heavy bombing. This showed the people of London that they really cared for them and their welfare. Among the towns visited by the King and Queen when they make a six-hour tour of Merseyside are Birkenhead and Wallasey. Wherever their majesties go, they meet the same high courage. The predominant sounds during this visit were cheering crowds, wailing sirens, and cries of, we can take it, your majesties, we can take it. It's part of general conversation these days to hear the other fellow in a voice simply bursting with excitement saying, blimey, come and see my place, there's nothing left. Now Hitler can't win a war against people like that. The king and queen see their roles as, as something of morale boosters. They are there to, to provide reassurance to the public, to recognize the, the hard work and effort that is going in to fighting this war on the home front. So it was a, it's a different kind of leadership to the, to the wars of before, in that George and his wife Elizabeth's roles were much more focused on Britain and the home front. On the morning of September 13th, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth were relaxing and drinking tea when they heard a rumble and loud crash. A German raider had dropped five high-explosive bombs on the palace. The Royal Chapel Inner Quadrangle, Palace Gates, and the Victoria Memorial were all hit by the bombs. Four members of the palace staff were injured, with one later dying from their injuries. The King and Queen were exceptionally nearly killed, and it was just a stroke of luck that, that they weren't. I mean, at one point, windows had been left open that probably wouldn't have been left open under normal circumstances. If the windows had been shut, they would have smashed into a thousand pieces of glass, probably would have killed everyone in the room. After the palace was bombed, they're both absolutely terrified. The king wrote in his diary that he couldn't quite believe what had happened and that he was very, very lucky to have escaped. But days later, he's, he's still writing, I look outside and I can't forget seeing the bomb. And it's quite clear that it had a kind of traumatic effect on both of them, but then if you've nearly died, it would have a traumatic effect on you. By this further deliberate attack on the lives of our king and queen, when five bombs fell on and around the palace, the home of our beloved sovereign and his consort is again damaged. One bomb crashed through the queen's drawing room, while others fell in the quadrangle. Within a few yards from where the king and queen were sheltering, the royal chapel was struck. Tearing through the roof, the bomb completely wrecked the altar and hurled 20 tons of debris into the basement. We thank God that their majesties were unhurt. But swift vengeance strikes at the black-hearted raider. A few seconds later, a Nazi plane was seen to break in pieces crashing within a short distance of Buckingham Palace. Thus ended the murderous attack on what the twisted Nazi mind called a military objective. May this planned attempt at assassination recoil a hundredfold on the beast of Berlin. Well, of course, the king and queen were shaken by the bombing. The incident would go on to boost their reputation with the British public. When the German Luftwaffe bombed Buckingham Palace, uh, the royal household made much of this moment, uh, using it to demonstrate that the royals were on the front line like their people, that they were suffering from the war uh, along with the British public. Uh, cameramen, uh, journalists were invited into Buckingham Palace to survey the damage, to photograph it, and, and images emerged on the front, front page of newspapers of the king in amongst the rubble, in amongst the debris of Buckingham Palace. Uh, demonstrating that the king, he was also affected by what was going on. The king and queen were advised by the foreign office to immediately flee the country, but the refusal to do so showed courage and a commitment to their country, and the public greatly appreciated this. In a statement to the nation, the queen exclaimed, the children will not leave unless I do. I shall not leave unless their father does and the king will not leave the country in any circumstances ever. Their defiance of the German Blitz gave the country a much needed boost in their war efforts and undoubtedly forged a sense of unity throughout the United Kingdom. 
As the war raged on, the king's role remained ever important. With visits to a number of locations outside of Britain, a vital morale-boosting mission for the men fighting for their country. Recognizing the total nature of modern warfare, in 1940, the King instituted the George Cross and George Medal to be awarded for acts of bravery by citizens. In 1942, the George Cross was awarded to the island and people of Malta in recognition of the heroism with which they had resisted the enemy siege. In 1943, the king met with General Montgomery in North Africa after the success of El Alamein. In wartime Britain, extraordinary circumstances became the cornerstone of everyday life. Some of us have been inclined to forget about our gas now. It's important that we should be prepared against gas. You all have a gas mask, and you ought to carry it and also to practice wearing it. Put it on for 10 to 15 minutes, one day a week. It may be a little irksome at first, but you'll soon get used to it. Don't forget, by the way, to wipe the inside dry after you've taken your mask off. Here in the Ministry of Home Security, we try to set an example by wearing our mask once a week for a few minutes. And this is what happens. Yes, mask on five minutes, please. <laughs> Gas masks on five minutes, please. Stick your chin well out. Do you find that you can work quite well in your mask? Yes, quite easily. And it's quite comfortable, is it? Yes, you soon get used to it. That's good. Now, don't forget to wipe your mask after you've used it. Dry the inside. History's greatest drama is being performed in the London theatre of war. The theme is the struggle against the forces of evil, opening as the symphony of gunfire crashes into its overture. <laughs> Like a scene from Dante's Inferno, the first act tells of destruction wrought by a devilish foe, which tries also to destroy the soul and wreck the morale of a nation by savage barbarism. A quest foredoomed to failure because they're ignorant of the spirit of the chief characters in the drama, the British people. So in their blind fury, they bomb churches, hospitals, and the homes and property of civilians. But as the drama unfolds, the tension relaxes, and we learn of instances of escape and courage. People laugh and jest as another day reveals the price the enemy has paid. Over the land are strewn the remains of flames which came to conquer and ended like this. Meanwhile, London carries on with unshakable mien. Windows may be broken, but the spirit remains intact. Now comes the twist from drama to light relief. Londoners were kept on their toes all night, so in the morning they cuss the devil and all his works and walk. But if you want to pop off early for lunch, you can always go through the window, but the cafe is moved to new premises. Dear sir, please note our new address. Hoping this finds you as it leaves us. For the next five years, the British had to endure the bombing of their towns and cities in the Blitz, as well as attacks from flying bombs and rockets. Three minutes before these pictures were taken, this was a block of London working class flats with shops at ground level. What the Nazis expect to gain from this senseless, indiscriminate bombing is beyond normal understanding. 
But as we have said before, we can take it. And we can rely upon our RAF to give the Nazis the hell they deserve. Britain gets another foretaste of aerial attack. This time, Nazi bombs are dropped on a northeast coast town. But fortunately, again, there are very few casualties. Eight civilians are wounded. The first bomb casualties in England. One little girl slept right through the raid and woke up afterwards to find her bed littered with pieces of a bomb. Here she is. The Germans have made another of their typical attacks on unfortified positions, a poultry farm in Sussex. But you have to admit that this one was a Nazi bomber in difficulties with our fighters and anti-aircraft guns. So in order to make a quicker getaway, he dropped his bomb and they landed on the chicken farm. And now Pathé Gazette presents an exclusive interview with some of the survivors. When you hear the sirens or anti-aircraft guns, you must get under cover at once. You must not stand staring up at the sky. That's the most dangerous thing to do. Take cover at once, but there's no need to rush. If you take things quietly, you'll prevent panic in others. If you're within five minutes of your home, go home, but keep away from the windows. Early in the enemy's intensified air attacks on London, bombs were dropped on the Dockland area. These caused a big fire, which as night fell, illuminated a wide section of London. In consequence, Nazi airmen, without a shadow of doubt, could have picked out other targets of military importance. But the Royal Air Force and our ground defences were inflicting heavy losses on the attacking air armadas, as many as 99 enemy raiders being brought down in one day. In their rage at these blows of their air might, the Nazis threw off all pretense of confining themselves to military targets, and the following pictures show that bombs have been scattered over London without any distinction of military objectives. In the East End, much damage has been done to business premises and homes. And the morning after this occurred, the German communique said that they attacked targets of military importance. Military importance? Look at it! In a West London district, some houses and a block of flats were struck. Targets of military importance, my foot! A bus was blown over like a kid's toy by a bomb which burst across the road. A tram, too, is a London tram car of military importance. Any war the Hun has ever fought has been aimed chiefly at the civilian. The coward always attacks the weak. A bright thought in the midst of scenes of devastation. What London goes through in the darkness of night is comparable only to the punishment being meted out by us on the war factories and truly military objectives of our despicable enemy. The king goes among his people to sympathize with them in their trials. He has a word of encouragement for all, including the ARP workers who have worked so magnificently in the cause of humanity. While Hitler and Goering are battering their heads against the indestructible wall of British civilization, tenacity and courage, we are proud to present faithful pictures of how, despite the Nazi methods of warfare, Britons will never bend the knee to force. Whatever has happened or may happen, we shall come through smiling. Rationing of food began in January 1940 and close in June 1941. By 1943, virtually every household item was either in short supply and had to be queued for, or it was unobtainable. In days gone by, we wouldn't have thought of lighting more than two cigarettes with one match, but with matches costing 12 times as much as in 1914, it's a different story. Mind your fingers. Cigarettes, too, are expensive, so we mugs, uh, males, have additional opportunities for courtly gestures. Fag rolling for the fair sex. While the necessity for shaving at odd times and places gives a city man a bright idea. The price of gaspers is high, so it behoves us to invent for economy. One girl has found a way of enjoying fags to the last puff. No good following her for her dog ends. And when it comes to silk stockings, the best solution is borrow Brother Bill's golf hose and forget your ladder worries. Another girl, afraid she might forget to remove her spectacles in a blitz, protects herself from glass splinters. Although it's not one of the little things, we pass scenes such as this with scarcely a glance. 
Hat styles have changed. Men have set the fashion for the ladies who seldom think of the freakish models they had wished on them before the war. Even the kiddies like to be in the fashion. Identity discs, some on the wrist, and if the ankle is slim, and if it isn't, oh, well, well. The contents of a man's pocket nowadays show many of the little things we have got used to. Whistle, ration card, petrol coupons, identity cards, and one of the little things we miss most of all, we offer a unique picture. The King visits the Air Ministry, a call at the Ministry of Home Security follows. Both visits precede a tour by the King and Queen of bombed areas in London. To Fulham, their Majesties bring a cheery word, and the Queen especially a friendly smile. At intervals, the Royal Party halt to have a word with ARP workers, demolition squads and firemen, who have done such splendid work at so great a risk. And the Queen smiles again as she insists on shaking the hand of a worker who apologises for its griminess. Having had their own home bombed, their Majesties speak with understanding and sympathy to those of their subjects who have also fallen victims to Nazi savagery. The Allies pushed into Western Germany in February 1945. On April 25th, the Red Army entered Berlin. Five days later, Adolf Hitler committed suicide and the Soviets captured the German parliament building, the Reichstag. After another Allied breakthrough in Italy, German forces were surrendered on May 2nd. Victory in Europe was declared for the Allies on May 8, 1945, following Germany's unconditional surrender. This led to the occupation and division of Germany. On VE, Victory in Europe Day, May 8, 1945, Buckingham Palace was a focal point of the celebrations. The war had immeasurably strengthened the link between the king and his people. The elation at winning the war was echoed around the country as the crowds of rejoicing civilians filled the streets, those around Buckingham Palace chanting for their king. When VE Day finally happened, George and his family were in the palace and this great cry went up, we want the king, we want the king. And I think that although he was overawed by it, and although obviously being a naturally shy and retiring man, it was a lot for him to take on. It was still a recognition that over the course of the Second World War, he had gone from being this figure who had been regarded with a sense of suspicion, a sense of distrust almost by the public who had preferred his brother, to being this lauded figure, along with Churchill, who was there on the balcony with him, that, that the two men were seen as absolutely indistinguishable in terms of their contribution to the, to the war effort, in terms of the importance for the British national character. And I think he, he ended the war in an exceptionally popular monarch. This is the British people's finest day, the day, the end of the German war. Throughout the country, at homes and at work, a nation exploded with spontaneous rejoicing for a great and wonderful deliverance. War scarred the face of Britain, but nothing ever sapped or changed the character of our people.
hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. But in the interest of saving lives, the ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded along all the fronts. The German war is therefore at an end. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Today is victory in Europe day. Staying with my aunt in London and was taken up west to many thousand of cheering, laughing, crying, singing people. I had never seen anything like it and was totally unprepared for my bear hug from an American soldier who lifted me right off my feet and swung me round and landed me a smacking kiss. Hallelujah! Later, we gathered outside Buckingham Palace. Who cares about rain? We began to chant, We want the king! We want the king! an understatement. Forgotten how we felt? Never. Not if I lived a thousand years. In London, after the deprivations, danger and heartache, we went crazy. We had the day off work. My friend and I went to the West End. We moved with the crowds down the mall to Buckingham Palace. We want George! We want Elizabeth! Was rewarded with their Majesty's balcony appearances. The people were in the thousands. Everyone singing, dancing, kissing. The crowd was so dense, anyone fainting was lifted horizontal above the crowds and carried off to cheers. A man we seem to have seen before somewhere looks down from a balcony in Whitehall. I remember the thrill and relief after the previous day's waiting for the Prime Minister's announcement of the end of the war in Europe. And my parents went out on the balcony in response to the huge crowds outside. I think we went on the balcony nearly every hour, six times. And then when the excitement of the floodlights being switched on got through to us, my sister and I realised we couldn't see what the crowds were enjoying. My mother had put her tiara on for the occasion, so we asked my parents if we could go out and see for ourselves. I remember we were terrified of being recognised, so I pulled my uniform cap well down over my eyes. A grenadier officer amongst our party of about 16 people said he refused to be seen in the company of another officer improperly dressed so I had to put my cap on normally. We cheered the king and queen on the balcony and then walked miles through the streets. I remember lines of unknown people linking arms and walking down Whitehall. All of us just swept along on a tide of happiness and relief. I remember the amazement of my cousin just back from four and a half years in a prisoner of war camp, walking freely with his family in the friendly throng. And I also remember when someone exchanged hats with a Dutch sailor, a poor man coming along with us in order to get his cap back. <laughs> After crossing Green Park, we stood outside and shouted, we want the king and we were successful in seeing my parents on the balcony. 
having cheated slightly because we sent a message into the house to say we were waiting outside. We know that in the days when the war I think remote, it was one of the most memorable the nights historic. of my life. They will tell another generation how we celebrated victory in Europe Day and how we thanked the service chiefs who worked so valiantly to make it possible. A large majority of the population tuned in for the King's radio broadcast uh, on VE Day. This, if you like, bookended uh, a conflict that had lasted almost six years and uh, for many represented uh, a sense of, of climax, a great sense of relief in terms of, of bringing the European war to an end. The King spoke about the sacrifice that ordinary members of the public had made, that that sacrifice uh, had been, been worth it, uh, in that the war had been won, fascism had been beaten, and that democracy would now prevail. Mm -hmm.